Hi everyone, this is Owen from the Hive Makerspace at Lakeland Community College. Uh, today I'm going to show you how I've been using a 3D printer and simple tools at home to manufacture over 200 of these face shields. Uh, these are being sent to uh, local and regional at-home healthcare workers. Um, and today I'm going to give you a little kind of sneak peek into the process that I've been using to do all of this from home. So let's get started. I'll be using a Maker Gear M3 independent dual to 3D print these face shields. But before I can do any of that, um, first thing I need to do is tell the machine what I want it to print. So I have my 3D files here, which I've downloaded from the National Institute of Health. Uh, they have a website that they call the 3D Print Exchange. Um, and it's something they've put together um, in order to enable anybody with access to a 3D printer uh, to, to help make a, as much PPE as possible and to provide it to local healthcare workers. So as you can see, I've arranged my models on the build plate so that I can fit two at once. Um, wherever possible, efficiency, um, and the way that you arrange your models is definitely helpful. Um, so, you know, you can't just send a 3D model directly to a 3D printer. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll apply a process. So I have uh, my material settings for the material that I'm using here. Um, you know, all of those settings specify information such as the thickness of the layers, uh, the speed at which the extruder is moving, uh, the temperature at which it's printing, and a whole bunch of other variables as you can see. Uh, but without going into those complicated uh, details, you know, you can essentially think of it like I'm applying the recipe that I have here on the left to the 3D geometry that I have here on the right. So when I go to prepare the print, uh, it's going to give me essentially a preview showing how the model is printed. And I can analyze that preview to identify any potential issues. Um, and if it's ready to go, I can go ahead and save that file. So the file that I originally downloaded was a 3D model. That, was, that file type was an STL file. Now, once I've ran it through this program and I've applied my process or recipe, if you will, uh, it becomes a new sort of file. It is now a G-code file. And that is a format that the machine that I have here can understand. Um, it's essentially uh, a bunch of code. It's step-by-step -step instructions that the machine can follow in order to create the geometries that you see here using the settings that I've specified. So now what I can do, hold on just a moment, now I've uploaded that file to the control interface for my 3D printer. So what you see here is essentially the, uh, the main dashboard for telling this little machine what to do. So I've chosen the file and I press print and the machine will sing me a little song to let me know that it heard my command. Um, and now the heated build plate here will heat up as well as the extruder here will heat up before the printing process commences. As soon as it's hot enough, the, the printing process will get started. So this happens at the beginning of every 3D print job with this machine. And what you see is what's called a touch probe. And that is taking a reading on the distance between the tip of the printing nozzle and the surface of the heated build plate. It takes a reading in the center, and then it will take several more readings throughout the um, throughout a sort of grid pattern located on the bed. What that's doing is it's creating a mesh um, and that information that's gathered by that sensor, the touch probe, uh, it is actually used by the machine to ensure that the first layer of this 3D print um, is the exact distance it needs to be away from the build plate so that it adheres perfectly. Um, you know, a lot of people who get started with 3D printing uh, have difficulty with leveling their build surface or leveling the bed, as they say. Um, and this sensor, this entire process, eliminates the hassle associated with that. So while it's good to have a level bed, any inconsistencies uh, present will be compensated by this mesh pattern that it is creating. So this happens at the beginning of every print uh, to ensure a, a high level of quality for the first layer um, and in turn ensures that the entire print will stick to the build plate until it's finished.
So the machine is now printing the perimeter layers, and after it finishes doing the perimeter layers, it will do what's called the solid infill. Uh, so there will be several solid layers for the bottom of this print, and then it will do sort of a hollowed infill structure in the middle, and then it will add more solid layers along the top of the model uh, towards the end. Uh, so you can think of it sort of like a shell with sort of a, a honeycomb uh, structure in the middle. And now you can see it's doing the first solid layer. So it starts with our outline or our perimeter layer and then it fills in the gaps in the middle. After removing the glass build surface from the heated build platform, you can see I have my, my two little visors for my face shield here. I'm going to use this um, spatula, some people call it a putty knife, uh, to remove them. So I'm essentially going to pry it off of the base of the glass and it kind of pops off pretty easily. Now here's that brim that I was referring to earlier, I can just peel this away. Um, there it is. So I'll remove the second one now. You can see it pops off pretty easily. Um, you'll notice I'm wearing nitrile gloves. Uh, I'll say more about uh, protective measures that I'm taking uh, to prevent any potential c contamination of these pieces, uh, but more on that later. So I've removed the parts from the glass build surface and I am ready to assemble. Now let's move on to the tools and materials that we'll be using. So one of the best ways to understand how something works or how something is made, in my opinion, is to take it apart. So if we look at this assembled mask here, you'll notice that we have the 3D printed visor. Uh, we have this uh, bottom piece over here, which is sort of a guide towards the chin. Uh, this is entirely optional. Um, it maintains sort of, uh, it, it helps ensure a certain curvature. But as you can see, when I remove it, it's pretty much the same. So this is you know, optional. Um, some people have chosen to include it in their versions. Uh, but as you can see, I have this simple visor. I have a sheet of acetate. So that's sort of like uh, the transparency film. If you're old enough, you can remember uh, seeing these in school on the overhead for our projector. Um, that is gonna form our protective cover. Uh, now, many people are using different kinds of plastics, uh, thicker plastics, which would be great uh, if you have access to a laser cutter, much more durable, a little bit thicker. Uh, unfortunately, I'm doing all of this from home, so uh, making do with what I have. Um, so in addition to the 3D printed visor and the acetate sheet, you'll notice I have some elastic band here, and this is called buttonhole elastic. Um, so it has little holes for buttons, as you can see. Uh, it's used in different uh, sewing and upholstery um, and garment applications. Um, so I'm just going to take these apart to kind of show you the process of how it all comes together. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And we have all of our materials over here. And we're going to let that bake just for a quick five minutes. Totally kidding. Do not put plastic things or elastic things in the oven. So I've got my acetate sheet here. Now I downloaded a template uh, from the same website where I downloaded the 3D models. I'm going to use that paper template uh, to sort of guide where I'm going to poke the holes. And now that I've got one perfect example uh, that I made from the paper template, uh, I can just use that as a guide for all the others. So if I line these up, I can simply use my handy dandy hole puncher uh, to punch some holes in the same location.
Next, I'm going to take my visor. And I can, you'll notice that the, the pieces that clip into the visor actually have these, these little teeth on them. Um, that's to prevent them from falling off. So rather than just a, a pin that comes directly outward, the shape of this guarantees that the sheet will stay adhered to the surface of the visor. So, sort of like a you sort of snap fit it into place. Um, you can kind of stretch this over one piece at a time. Most of the hard work is done at this point. Now, there is a small slot here where my button hole elastic will slide on. And as you can see, that's on one side. Wrap it around. And install it on this side. Again, we have the optional second piece. If, if that's a part of it, you can simply slide that on. And there's actually, if you look up close, there are holes here. On the, so the plastic will slide through this slot, and there's actually small rivets, uh, little features, that actually apply pressure to the acetate sheet um, that hold it in place. So it's not simply just sliding on. There is a feature in this design that applies pressure in order to ensure that it stays in place. And there we have it. Now some people you'll see, they apply a small strip of foam to the inside of the visor uh, where it makes contact with the forehead. That's definitely recommended. Uh, for optimal comfort. However, uh, to, to bring down the cost and to simplify the assembly process, uh, the, the partners that I am working with have opted out of the foam um, component of the construction of this piece. So, uh, you know, there's many different ways that you can do this, but that's the long and the short of it. Now let's talk a little bit about safety and uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here. So you'll notice that I'm wearing gloves. Uh, anybody who is building these face shields should ideally be wearing an N95 mask or a respirator. Uh, that's to prevent any contamination of the pieces that will be sent out to healthcare workers. Um, in addition to those precautions, because this is not a perfect environment, it's not a clean room, um, we also, after packaging all of the masks, we let them sit for a total of three days um, before they're sent out. Uh, that way, if there are any active microbes uh, on the surface of these pieces, uh, that three-day period will be sufficient in order for those microbes to die off. So uh, there will be no pathogens or anything of that sort uh, and sort of prevents any kind of unintentional contamination. Thanks for joining me. Um, stay tuned for more cool and engaging and inspiring videos from the Hive Makerspace team. And uh, hope everybody is doing well. Uh, best wishes from my family to yours. Um, just kind of hanging out here, holed up in my apartment, trying to be as productive as possible. So it's, uh, it's been a fun little break doing this video. And uh, so glad you guys joined us. Bye.